Hello, and I'm back, and I am on the line here with the one and only Brent Kremen. This is the criminal. I love it, man. That's a great name. Yeah, I was given that in, in, in uh, probably elementary school. Were you a, a troubled child? In- I got good grades. I actually liked school, um, but I was a horrible athlete, and I had trouble bonding with the boys. Uh, the um, girls, like in kindergarten, they tended to like me because I was considered to be sweet, but um, but I couldn't bond with the boys, and so I had to be a clown in order to get them to laugh, and that worked. After that, I was such a class clown that that I think the girls didn't like me because I was considered too much of a clown, and you know they couldn't take me seriously, and I was immature. So I got a uh, reputation for being very immature for my age. But the guys, I, I'd make laugh until they were crying. Thus, I was the criminal. Has that continued? No, no. I mean, somebody wrote in my high school yearbook, uh, senior year. Uh, Mercer Scotland High School, which was a great school. Um, Barack Obama's mother went there. Uh, the um, uh, he wrote, uh, "Hey, have a you know, have a great years in college, but you might need to curb the pranks. The stuff that you do in high school will get you thrown out of college." So you went to college? Yes, I wasn't a very good student. I went to four different schools. It got it took me four years to get a two year degree, and then after I completed that, I transferred to a four-year school, the University of Washington, took me an additional three years to complete two. So that would be a total of seven years of college to complete four. And I got about a 2.5 GPA. Why the well, change? Well, you, you don't have structure in college. You're left to your own devices. The work was more difficult. I had more issues with stamina, and my stamina has gotten worse as I've gotten older, just mental stamina. I remember in college... Uh, Sitting through a two-hour class was difficult for me. Even though I really enjoyed the lecture material, that was difficult for me to maintain focus. Now I enjoy going to Torah study, and I'm still, even though I enjoy it, and I participate a lot, and I'm considered a leader in there, I'm constantly staring at the clock, when's it over, when's it over, when's it over? And this is something that I like. I choose to get up on Saturday morning to go to Torah study, but I'm exhausted after an hour. I didn't have these issues when I was a kid. These issues happened when I became older. In high school, I did fine. My, I, I could maintain focus. I had stamina. In college, things were worse. After college, the wheels have coming off. Well, it looks like yeah. that you need a career in show business. Yeah, I've done open mic night on comedy. All I do is I just tell the truth about my life. If people laugh, great. If they cry, fine. I really don't care as long as I get a reaction. Or even if I don't get a reaction, I just do it for therapeutic reasons. And then the last line of my stand-up routine is, I'm Brent Kremen, and I'm not kidding. Because I don't have I – don't, I don't go and tell – it's the truth, the truth, the truth, and then the punchline's a lie. No, I just go and tell the truth all the way through. And so what is yeah. it that you talk about in your act? It's not like really you... an act. I just talk about things that are going on in my life. Like imagine imagine the stuff that I tell Brian and Vinny, whether it's in private and they ended up putting it on the air or whether it is actually on the show. You, I would just go and talk about the things that, like I mentioned on the show. Talk about where you get your fame from because when I mentioned that you were on the show on the board, I got a lot of listeners. You have a lot of fans from the board. When Brian and Vinny post stuff from the Christmas show uh, that, 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 that features just me, uh, there were 20,000 views for that. You get ratings. I mean, that's that's no question. I think your dynamic with Brian is good. I've known Brian since he was just finishing the Youth Wrestling Federation. No, I actually would watch the Youth Wrestling Federation on public access television where he and his buddies would wrestle in the gym when they were 15, 16 years old. I would watch this when I was in college, and uh, as I'm a bit older than him. Uh, and so uh, he calls me young Brent Kremen when I'm actually older than him. Uh, and so I would watch that on TV, uh, and then I would go to a show at an old decrepit arena, which they later tore down, the um, the uh, old uh, Seattle Center Arena, Mercer Arena, and they would have wrestling shows there dating back to the Don Owen days. And so there, there was a wrestling show there, and I think a guy named Dan Adam was passing out flyers about a local wrestling hotline. And 
his uncle Uncle Wayne, Crazy Wayne, would make jokes about the Yeti and talk about the, you know the Yeti hotline. You know, just just real toilet humor, just immature stuff. And but I but but we but, you know, he would joke about the Yeti on there, and his hotline is basically garbage. But I enjoyed listening to it. It was funny. And then later, I I, I saw the figure four about issue number twelve, and Craig Proper was just a guy that wrote a letter. That's how it started, and I actually had a column in some early figure fours, and I actually saved the figure fours and gave them to Brian, otherwise he would not have them. So I'm a subscriber back, like issue number 12, and he used to live with his parents, didn't have a car, and so I'm so proud that one year, this would have been about five years ago, or maybe 10, no, it's probably 10 years ago now, shortly after he met Whitney, where he has this beautiful home that's like a mansion in Bothell, Washington, and I call it the Palatial Alvarez Estate. And I gave him a double high five, nearly knocking him over, because he has, he had, at the time, he had a wonderful, beautiful, kind wife. I was at the wedding, and he has a beautiful home. And I know where he started, and so I'm so proud of him. You were thinking that he doesn't like you, but I, I think he does. Um, Vinny doesn't but, like me, no. Brian likes me. Vinny does not like me. Do you really think Vinny doesn't like you? Or you make he him said feel a number of times he hates me. Oh, well, Vinny hate is not very strong hate. It's more He's not like very he friendly to me, that's for sure. And he did get very really angry at me when I simply said hello to his wife. Wow. And I was invited to Brian's wedding, wedding and specifically banned from Vinny's wedding, so that should tell you something. Well, that's, <laughs> but you still hang out with him now and then. I only hang out with Vinny when Brian is there. Right, of course. You're not going to hang out with him alone. I have no problems with him. I'd hang out with Vinny, but he wouldn't. Let me ask you, though, with uh, regard to Vinny, is it because he has just been particularly witnessing of the more crazy moments of your life? Do you tend to act think, crazy around Brian? I think Brian? he does not find my hijinks as amusing as Brian. I think he finds them more annoying. It's like Larry David. Some people find him annoying. Some people find him hilarious. Some people find him cringeworthy. And if you're right. Larry David, up to 30 years, you've had enough. And you say, Larry, the kids are out of the house. I'm done. I can't take it anymore. Goodbye. Give me my $400 million, and I never want to speak to you again. But does Brian bring out a part of a thing in you that make you a little crazy or is it is that just how you are brian you know that brian somewhat enjoys it at least i know he gets uncomfortable from yeah. it too but but he, he likes to be uncomfortable i think on a certain level he likes the unpredictability of it whereas Vinny is i don't know Vinny just can't take it he just doesn't want to deal with it so let's uh, <laughs> all right i i want i wanted to, to say that on a personal note one thing that I found puzzling is when I showed up at Super China Buffet Day, where it was a fast day, so I couldn't eat, uh, I didn't have any money to, to pay for anything anyway, and I simply went there for the company. And then they, then they went and watched SummerSlam, not at a big party, because Brian is not doing that this year, but basically a few of them watched SummerSlam together and did a show together. I could have gone on that show. I could have gotten paid for it. But I wasn't invited. I asked, I wasn't invited, and then Brian was making jokes about why I was hanging around the table. I was just simply gathering my newspapers and taking the bus home. And I was feeling a little sad that I couldn't watch the show with them and, and do the and do the do the uh, show afterwards. But what Brian said on that post Super China Buffet post SummerSlam show was, if I'm not a one on a scale of one to ten, don't show up at all. Well, and he said I was a one when Lance was there, because I had you know a few years ago because I got the message that I better not cause a scene at Brian's house, I better not do anything to annoy Whitney or to annoy anyone, and so I did sit there quietly, and I knew that Lance was right over there and Lance would, you know, could beat me up, and so yeah, I purposely was real, real Lance quiet. Beat you up? <laughs> Good. But uh, you know, if he wanted, so um, you know, I, I um, was real quiet. And the thing is that if I follow Brian's wishes that he said on the air of showing up at Super China Buffet Day and being a one, people are like, "What's up with Brent? What's wrong with him?" 
There's no show. Me at a one, there's no show, there's no amusement, there's no guest appearances. Me at a one is not funny. <laughs> so why would Brian want me to be at a one? Because there would be no Brent stories at a one. That's what I don't well, understand. Yeah, it's a diff- it's a conundrum because you don't want to be constantly, you know, you don't want to be constantly on because then you become like Jim Carrey, right? I mean, you don't want to be Jim yeah, Carrey. Yeah, I, I can't be at a ten because because Bro- Vinny said he threw me out of a car when I was at a ten. But I was pro- <laughs> but they said that I was probably like an eight or a nine at that dinner. I would say I was more like a seven or an eight. Tell me what you did at this dinner that made you a seven or an eight because I'm not really understanding you. Oh, just, just being constantly yourself. making jokes telling stories, because basically I was surrounded by delicious food. I hadn't eaten anything all day, and it was a fast day, the day that the temple was destroyed. Both temples were destroyed that day, so it's a very serious, solemn fast day. And so I'm staring at delicious food that I cannot eat. And so I had to tell stories to people to distract myself from the food. And so I was just constantly making jokes and telling stories the entire time. So you were a major 10 because you were hungry. You well, were I was like, probably Jesus like Christ. a 7 or 8. Yeah, I was hungry. I was staring at delicious food that I could not eat and wow. watching everyone else eat. That must have made you super hyper and super weird. Oh, yeah. And and so you were in people's face, probably. No, I was just simply sitting at the table telling stories and making jokes. You know, everybody else was sitting at the table eating, and I was sitting there eating nothing, uh, drinking water, which I wasn't even supposed to do, but I was drinking water. I don't care. And, uh, you know, and telling jokes and making stories. Was anyone telling you to shut up? Oh, yes. Vinny, constantly. (laughs) I think he doesn't get you, but it shouldn't matter to you. Does it matter to you? I'd like to be Vinny's friend. I would have liked to go to the wedding. I would have preferred not to be banned. You would have had to live your life as a one, right? I mean, for that to have happened. Yeah, if I lived my life, if I was around them as a one, I would not be a character, I would not be on the show, and I would not be their friend. Right. You wouldn't even be talking right now. No, I wouldn't. Why would Brian tell me, if you're not going to be a one, don't show up at all next year? So basically he's saying our friendship is over. Who said that? Brian, when he was on the show... The post Summer Slam show, where they open the post Summer Slam show talking about me for 10 minutes, which is what they always do. When there's a Super China buffet, they always talk about me for the first 10 minutes. Even Brian's, Brian's bachelor party show, they, spent, they didn't talk about the bachelor party. They spent a whole hour talking about me, which made me feel happy. So, anyway, um, <laughs> any, anyway. Um, you love it. So, so every, the first 10 minutes. Every year of the SummerSlam show is, well, we can talk about this and SummerSlam and this and that, but let's talk about Brent. So that's always the opening of the show is talking about Brent. Only Brian at the finishes it by saying, okay, Brent, if you're listening to this, if you're not a one next year, don't bother to show up. But the thing is, if I show up and I'm a one, there's nothing to talk about. Or if I yeah, show I up know, and I'm but... a one, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna be his friend anymore because I'd be boring. Well, he's but he has to play the baby face, and you have to play the heel, right? I mean, so that's what he's doing. I, so that's that's how I interpret it. Like, I hope he's for, not serious with that comment, as if he thinks about it, it doesn't make any sense. No, but for Vinny, it's a shoot. Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, are you back into wrestling now with AEW and all that? I've watched some of it. Tony Schiavone's about. 10, 15 year break from wrestling. He wouldn't talk about wrestling. He wanted nothing to do with wrestling. And then about two years ago or less, he started talking about wrestling again. And he started doing a show, You Remember When, where he's talking about his old WCW and Jim Crockett promotions days. And yes, he still is the announcer for the Atlanta Braves AAA baseball team. He still does morning news in Atlanta. He still does morning news in another city at the same time. And he still does the Georgia Bulldogs postgame show. And he still does, I think, the Georgia Bulldogs pregame show for football. And so he's a very busy man. How he manages time to do AEW, is that, is that on live every week? How he manages to do that, I have no idea. But... But his break from wrestling has been good for him because he said he was flat out burned out at the end of WCW. He didn't like his job very much. And so his break has helped him. And obviously Jim Ross is a good announcer, although I believe if Jan Ross was was still alive, Jim would not be announcing. Jan Ross's tragic death totally changed his life. 
and it made being home unappealing for him. And so he yeah. would not be an announcer right now if his wife was alive. I think he's the biggest get that the AEW has right now. Oh, because... I agree. If Jim Ross and Tony Schiavone were not there, I would have a lot less interest in it. Because I can't help myself. I haven't followed wrestling closely enough where I don't know who any of these guys are. And so, therefore, the announcers are the draw. And also, you get that feel of the old-time 90s wrestling. Before that, Jim Ross and Tony Schiavone were par- announcing partners on uh, old World Championship Wrestling on TBS. David Crockett took himself off the show as he knew he was a terrible announcer, and Ross and Shivani did that together. And then they had Ross and Shivani did some of the pay-per-views together, and then they yeah. sat down with Jim Hurd, and they say, okay, you two, uh, I know, Jim, we promised that you'd be the primary announcer, and we promised Tony you'd be the primary announcer. And so they, you know, Tony did a show where they asked him about this recently. And he says, yeah, I had no problem with that. Jim would get to be the TV to do the TBS show, and I would get to do all the syndication. They split us up, and uh, we were both the primary announcer. And then I got an offer from Vince McMahon that I couldn't refuse. And then after, because it was so much money, and then after a year, uh, Vince didn't like me, and he says, we don't want you anymore, and so he went home. And he's, Vince McMahon did not like Tony Schiavone. He felt that he was too Southern. I don't know if he didn't. I think he sure he liked him personally, but he didn't like his announcing. And so Vince basically was unhappy with him, and Tony got an offer to go back to WCW for a lot of money. But when he went back to WCW, the problem was that it was so poorly run that he was miserable. And he stayed there until the day that it closed. And so when they had that boom period, he was happy. But when things started going downhill and he stuck there until the last day and everybody said he was a horrible announcer, he says, I was a horrible announcer. I was completely burned out. I was miserable. I hated the product. Yeah, and it's interesting because at that very time, Ross was at the peak of his game. Correct. Those two voices were the voices of our... You know, late teens. Uh, yeah, and so really my fondest memories of Ross and Shivani is when they would announce together on the TBS show. They were great together. They were one of the best duos out there, for sure. I agree. And when, when you threw Gordon together. Soley in there, that was such a great announcing crew. And you had Bob Cottle, who was the old Mid-Atlantic announcer. And then then you even had Lance Russell. That was the best announcing crew ever. You had Gordon Soley. You had Bob Cottle. You had Lance Russell, Jim Ross, and Tony Schiavone. There's never going to be anything like that again ever, nor was there. The the WWF just had Gene Okerlund. That's about it. And uh, Lord Alfred Hayes. (laughs) I liked... You uh, you know, Meltzer did not did not like the job that Gorilla Monsoon did. He felt that he was a horrible announcer. But I think Gorilla was a very good announcer. I loved watching oh. Gorilla. Gorilla was great. What, why would he say yeah. he was bad? Meltzer didn't, didn't feel that he was a very good announcer in terms of calling the matches. But I thought he was great. Why well, wouldn't I mean, he be good at calling the matches? He was a wrestler himself. Yeah, he would talk about the muscle group. I thought he was I, great I think explaining. I read some stuff that he made some of that up, and it wasn't true, but then it might be true. I don't know. Who I cares? just know I found him entertaining. He was, of course, great with Bobby Heenan. He was great with Jim Ross. I loved the Jim ross uh, Gorilla Monsoon pairing. That was one of my favorites. Who could Heenan. you think of Monsoon with anyone? He was great. Did Heenan ever mix it up with Ross? I used to watch WWF Challenge, which was the B-show, just to be... Uh, Ross and Monsoon together. And Ross had said, when I got there, I wasn't accepted. I was considered a WCW guy. They were really, really mean to me. I was hazed. And and he says, Monsoon walks in and he says, guys, knock it off. He's one of us. He's a professional. Now stop this crap and I don't ever want to see it again. (laughs) And so Gorilla Monsoon stuck up for him and he loved Gorilla. That's great. That's a great story. Yeah. So... What do you know about in terms of Gorilla just behind the scenes? Was he always like just the locker room leader? Everybody loved him. Nobody said anything bad about him. You know, he would go and and he would book the house shows. He would, uh, you know, by by taking off his glasses. You know, he was almost blind. By taking off his glasses, that's how he announced that I want you to go to the finish. I heard the story uh, on a shoot interview with Bruno Sammartino. Vince Sr. called in Bruno Sammartino, and he says, Bruno, I want to sell Toots Mont is dead. I want to, or, or he's an alcoholic, or he's on his way out. 
uh, shortly to be dead. I, or, or, I, don't, I don't think Finn Cedar said it's shortly to be dead. But he says, you know, I need, I need to sell 50% of the promotion. Bruno, do you want it? Bruno says, no, I don't want 50% of the promotion. And so he sold 20% to Gorilla Monsoon. Phil Zacco, Willie Gilmsenberg were the minority owners. And so what happened is Monsoon owned 20% of the promotion. When Vincent Kennedy McMahon bought all the partners, he promised Gorilla, I think, 5% of the gate at every house show. So Gorilla got quite rich after that on that that, deal. Wow. Yes, he got 5% of the gross of every house show that they had, and they were having three house shows a night. So we really got to be very wealthy. That's great. That's so what he got they, in order to give up his share. That's 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 some cold, hard cash right there because they were booming. Yeah. I always thought he was not very impressive as a wrestler, but... See no, he was, a big, he was a big lumbering guy. You know, Meltzer said that he saw him in person in a match, and in the main event, and he said that he was terrible. He ne- he right. never got in the Observer Hall of Fame, and Meltzer was an advocate of him not getting in the Observer Hall of Fame. I completely disagree with that, but the voters of the Observer Hall of Fame never put Gorilla in, not as a wrestler, not as an announcer, and not as a backstage person. Do you think the, the Hall of Fame rules are too strict? I think that overall the Observer Hall of Fame is... is uh, is the most fair and the least political. For whatever reason, the voters say no. And uh, Meltzer does not vote. He does not have a voice. But, you know, when he, advocates that, when he advocates for somebody not being in there, that does carry some weight. Is Junkyard Dog in there? Yeah, I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure he is because he was a huge star in New Orleans. He basically, you know, they, they'd say, the New Orleans Saints, they say, who dat? Who dat? Who dat going to beat that dog? Well, that came... I mean, who that going to beat them Saints? It was originally who that going to beat that dog, because he used to sell out the New Orleans Superdome. Wow! Yeah, I had so no da- idea. yeah, he's definitely in there because he was a huge star in, in New Orleans. He was a huge star for Mid South. Bill Watts. Yeah, and like Jerry Lawler's in there. The, the, the number one stars from the territories are all in there. Junkyard Dog was the number one star from Watts' territory. It took Sting to come to the WWE to get in there, though. I was against him going to the WWE, as I knew that they were just going to use it to job him. I don't understand what the point of him going in there and getting jobbed to Triple H was. He should have never gone, and I thought that from the beginning. Hey, get the payday. You would have taken it. Yeah, I suppose it's just about the pay. He, he doesn't care if he just goes there and does jobs. I guess it was just about the money for him. When you have the face paint, you can go a lot longer than, than other wrestlers. True. And, he, and he never had that big match with The Undertaker. No, Paul Levesque just wanted to beat up Sting. Why he felt the need to do that, I don't know. They don't call the game for nothing. What is the ultimate political move? Boss's wife. Ultimate game. So, yeah, he's all game. And he's going to be the one that's going to take over everything. I would not count out Stephanie, and I would not count out Shane coming back either, because when Shane sold all that stock, and then he had some of his own companies, the reason why Shane quit as an executive was he was trying to save the relationship with his father, as he and his father had business differences, and uh, and he didn't want it to hurt their personal relationship, so that's why he quit. But if his father's dead, there's no reason he won't come back. But does he have even ownership stake in it at this point? Yeah, he has some stock, but he doesn't have much. Yeah, nothing controlling. But what's going to happen with Vince's stock? He'll probably leave half for Shane and half for Stephanie. If Linda's still alive, she'll get all of it. And then when Linda's dead, uh, when Linda's dead, she'll give it to the children. Yeah, but who's going to run day-to-day the way Vince does? Well, I believe that Shane, Marissa, and everybody forgets about Marissa, Stephanie and Paul will run it. Already one of Paul and Stephanie's daughters is 14, and she's already training to be a wrestler. You know what will happen when the minute that Vince stops controlling WWE is there going to be a lot of his stupid ideas are going to go away. And well, I that's think true. His, all this, ha, all this, you know, the, 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 this humor where Vince was an announcer, he'd say, ha, 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 all that stuff's going to be gone. All that Pat Patterson um, juvenile humor is going to be gone. Yeah, it's funny because he's always tried to outlive the juvenileness of 
pro wrestling, but he's one of the major creators of that image. Yes, he created it. I mean, the the other promotions, and even his father's promotion, it was it was it was designed for non college educated men. That was their audience. Non college educated blue collar men with blood and guts. That's who the audience was. Yeah. And Vince decides to to have clowns throwing pies in Jeff Jarrett's face. Because everybody talks about how the ad revenue for pro wrestling is so paltry because they assume that the people who are watching it don't have any money. Uh because they're they're low class people. Um yes. And 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 he's probably drove it down in that image. I mean, because if you look at like the mid south stuff, that is correct. Stuff, I mean, the, and the, 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 uh, Trish Trad is barking like a dog is not going to help with advertisers. Right. Yeah, I mean that 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 that, that clip might have cost Linda a Senate job because both of her political opponents would play that clip in, in their ads. That was kind of hot, though, that clip, I thought. But uh, No. I know, I'm kidding. <laughs> you don't think that Blumenthal and, uh, who was the other senator, Chris, Christopher Hayes, you don't think they used that in, in their campaign? <laughs> I think they all did, and I think they should have. Now, Linda McMahon, I think she quit the Trump administration, right? She's no That's longger correct. in it. She's still like... personal friends with Donald Trump. They have been ever since he hosted WrestleMania 4 and 5 at Trump Plaza. Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino, WrestleMania Four. Remember, remember when Vince plugged those on old primetime wrestling? Trump hosted WrestleMania Four and Five at Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino, and they had Gorilla and Bobby do primetime wrestling for there. And Gorilla was at the blackjack tables, which I actually bet was a shoot. That's how the friendship developed. Wasn't their highest pay per view number with the one with Trump, right? Because the one they did later on. Yeah, with Trump. yeah, yeah. Years, years later, when Trump came back as a TV character, as a heel, back then he was just sort of hosting the show and he would sit in the audience. When he came back as a TV character, yeah, yeah that, that had the most buys of any WrestleMania at that point, yes. Because they were going to shave Trump's head. Because people are fascinated about Trump's hair. So that right. I think it was. But we knew that wasn't going to happen. It was the ultimate the, hair versus hair match. Yes, but we knew that Vince would lose his hair because he, as he owns the company, and he, Vince is famous in wrestling, but he's not famous worldwide. They knew Donald Trump was not going to get shaved bald. You know what I, I realized though about Vince is the reason why he wants to turn wrestling into a farce is because he can control it. When you have a promotion that's based on star power. Those stars can walk. Instead, you you make this carnival atmosphere where everybody's just a little monkey in your troop. Yeah, the stars can walk, but when they had the, the old NWA, all the promoters were like buddies with each other, and they would trade. And whenever somebody was was not over anymore or needed a break or wanted to, you know, or wanted to go somewhere because of family or whatever reason – uh, they would they would trade them around, and so when 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 somebody got burned out in one territory, they would just go to another. And then yeah. there was Sam Mushnick, who was the president of of the NWA, and he didn't want to do a territory. He just did St. Louis, so he would bring in the stars from all around the world. And so Sam Mushnick, St. Louis wrestling at the Chase, that was the best show in the country because he brought in all the best. And he also determined who the champion was. He did, the, the, whoever the NWA champion was, Sam Mushnick basically had the ultimate call. There was a time, I remember, when you were very much smitten with one Missy Hyatt. Is this because of your childhood with, like, seeing her on TV? Yeah, I did. I, I never saw her at her best in, in world class. I never saw that. I saw her in WCW and she made me laugh and she would talk about, she would talk about going to the locker room and having all the scoops, you know, and, and she would go and stick her head in the locker room and make faces, you know, uh, it, she, she, she made me laugh. I liked her. Of course she was very pretty back even at WCW. Then, then I, uh, heard more about, how uh, Missy was not terribly choosy uh, as far as um, men that she had more than friendships with, uh, and the, this this did not scare me away uh, because you judge somebody by their character. 
you judge somebody by how they treat people outside the bedroom. And the reality is Missy had a lot of people that like her. And everybody knows her history behind the scenes. And yet she gets a lot of interviews. And, you know, there's a, there's a four-letter word that people call women. And she could get labeled with that word. But the reality is I think that people respect her in the wrestling business. She is what she is. And people actually respected her. Would you agree? Yeah, I think she did it her way. And she should be commended for that. I, I have nothing, no yeah, problem with her. She didn't hide who she was right. or what her history was or what she was doing when she was in the business. And people actually respected her. Yeah. She's great. It's I not like people movie. were calling her something and she was denying it. She wrote a book. Yeah, I love her. I think she was she was one of my all-time favorite characters. I remember when she was in the UWF and she was like Yeah, I don't. Uh, I wish I saw those days. I saw some clips. I mean, he, yeah. He, yeah, she was she was great. And um she was the probably know, one we're, of the most beautiful women. But we're basically in what made me smitten with her in a serious way, is that she had done some interviews where she said that she is Jewish. And as she might have mentioned in the book, we know John Tatum, her, her first serious boyfriend, is Jewish. And we know that, um, we know that Missy wrote a song, a version of the Hanukkah song by Adam Sandler, only she put all wrestlers in it. And so you can somehow find that song, and so she put herself in the song. So Missy, when she said that she's a Scientologist, that was a rib. That was simply designed to get me not interested. Because Missy, at this point, I would, not, I would have no interest in other than the fact that she's Jewish. And Missy realizes this. She's a smart woman, and so she came up with a gimmick that she was a Scientologist just to get me uninterested. (laughs) Was she afraid of you? No, I just think that Missy has no interest in me, and I figured that the way that she could, the best way that she could get a, get me away from her, you know, in terms of being 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 interested in her, is to simply tell me that that she's a sign, Scientologist. Now, if that was actually true, which it isn't, it was a game designed to get me away. But if that was true, you know, she's correct. I would not be interested in her. <laughs> when have you hung out with her though in person? Never, because when I was in Dallas, I didn't know that she was. I did not know that she had her retirement show. Uh, I didn't know this, and so I just figured that I would run into her, uh, or somebody could get her that necklace at the at the Hall of Fame um, event because I because as when she was in world class. She had interactions with the Freebirds, and she was good friends with Michael Hayes, according to her book, as at the time they were. And so I figured she would want to see the Freebirds get inducted. And she wasn't there. She was actually doing her retirement show. And it turned out that, you know, Missy and uh, Craig and Brian and Vinny all went with Missy Hyatt to Dealey Plaza and they actually went out with Missy Hyatt for a while, and I wasn't even told about it. Wow. Yeah, they they spent time with her in Dallas, and I wasn't even told about it. I didn't hear about it until I heard about it on the show. Did that upset you, that they didn't bring you along? Yeah, I think that would have been nice if they told me. Yeah. I would have gone. I would actually spend time with her in person. They feel that the money is when... Uh, but we've done a couple of appearances together on the show, uh, and so she'll go and grill me and make me look like a fool. I think that that's where they think the money is. Yeah, that's where I think the money is. I'm going to try to get her on this show to grill you. Great. Tell her that I know the Scientology bit was just a lie to get me to um, go away. And uh, maybe she really is a Scientologist now. It's possible that her mother is not Jewish and that she converted to Judaism and and, and then she left uh, and decided to do Scientology. So if that is true, then, um, then whatever denomination did the conversion, if she did a reform conversion 
and then decided that she didn't buy it anymore and that she doesn't want to be a Jew, the reform would say she's not a Jew. However, if she did a conservative conversion, the conservatives would say even if she leaves Judaism, she still is a Jew. Once you do a conversion, you can't take it back. And the Orthodox also agree. Once you do a conversion, you can't take it back. However, the Reform say, you can do a conversion and you can't take it back. However, if the person decides they no longer want to practice, then they're no longer a Jew. Only the Reform believe that. And, and Missy, it just doesn't strike me as a person who can handle an Orthodox Jewish conversion. I, that just doesn't seem like her. So it is possible that she got a, a Jewish conversion in the Reform or Conservative movement and then decided her, to do Scientology instead. Is that her later. real name? Melissa Hyatt, H-I-A-T-T. Okay. She took her name, she changed the I to a Y, and came up with the Hyatt Hotels heiress. And that's where she got her gimmick. Oh, so she's like a Hilton. I got it. Misty Hyatt. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, Hyatt Hotels. Yeah. Brilliant. Which is obviously, not, yes, that was the gimmick. And I think she's like one of the first implant ladies. I mean, she got implants way back in the 80s. Oh, well, that's true. Yes. That's true. Um, she must have come up from nothing. Or did she? Yeah, Maybe she was she in Tallahassee, Florida. You read her, read her book. You know, she liked wrestling as a kid. She said the first thing that she saw in wrestling, her dad had it on, and she sees um, Terry Gordy wearing diapers in a baby bottle after he loses this match, and she says, what the hell is this? And then he says, wrestling. And so that was the first <laughs> thing she saw. Is she saw uh, she saw there was a match where the loser had to dress up like a baby, and so they have. Can you imagine Terry Gordy at like 18 years old, who's wearing diapers and a he baby? He looked like a big baby. Yeah, he, yeah. He's, that's a great first memory. What's your first memory of wrestling? The Steamboat Savage Bell Angle. That was very shocking, and it brought Bruno San Martino out from retirement. According to Bruno, Hogan was not selling out the shows. He was not succeeding as far as as the champion. Uh, he was not selling out the shows, and so and so Vince wanted Bruno back to sell out the shows, and so that Bruno didn't want to come back. He knew that he was terrible in the ring. He knew he was old and in pain. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want because he knew that his matches weren't very good, and he didn't want to show the fans this. But Vince. Vince says, well, Bruno, if you come back, I'll hire your son. And whenever whenever Bruno didn't want to do something, then his son would get de-pushed. And whenever Bruno did a show that Vince won, his son would get re-pushed. And then when Bruno quit, they fired David, of course. Because it was all manipulated in order to get Bruno back because Hogan wasn't selling out the shows. I mean, I can, says, I can believe it. Bruno says, I sold out the garden. Hogan was there the month before, and he didn't sell it out. They bring me in, and, they, and when we sell it out. <laughs> Him against Savage. So the other promoters and other wrestlers would always knock uh, the the uh, Worldwide Wrestling Federation because they say, it's nothing. They do Madison Square Garden once a month. We have to run the Memphis Coliseum once a week. It's not very difficult <laughs> to book a show once a month. You know, that's, that's 12 shows a year. We have to do 52 shows a year. We would sell out the Mid- Mid-South Coliseum half the time or a quarter of the time. We had as good average attendance in a much smaller town, or at least close to it, than 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 they have in New York. And we had to have a show weekly. So that's what the other promoters would say. What was your opinion of Hogan as a top star? Well, you know, I, I started watching them, and he put on a good show. You know, I remember when I was a little kid, they talked about, "Hey, that's like big time wrestling," because. That was that must have been back in the territory days when they started talking about big time wrestling. We were in the Portland territory, Don Owen. Portland was where the territory was headquartered, and Seattle was a satellite. And so all of a sudden, people stopped talking about big time wrestling, and they started calling it WWF. Because what happened is that finally in Seattle, Vince must have gone to the local station in Seattle and say. You know, Channel 11, I think, KSTW, get this Portland wrestling, get this big-time wrestling off the air. Here's a big suitcase and put my show on. And so finally when they took over Seattle, you know, that hurt Don Owen that, uh, you know, that they, that they um, you know, that that was right when Hogan was 
was really popular, and so they started talking about Hulk Hogan in school, and they had those um, those foam fi- yellow foam fingers, and uh, everybody at school was talking about Hogan and Andre, and you know he was obviously a huge star that was big in the mainstream. And Don Owens wrestling, I mean, the boys would talk about big-time wrestling, but even the girls knew about WWF. So he was very effective as far as mainstream publicity. Don't you think that even at that time that the WWF was more serious than it is today? It was different. I mean, it was it was Pat Patterson and uh, Vince McMahon sitting by Vince's pool writing the show, just the two of them. And if anyone else went out there... Uh, they got thrown in the pool, literally. And then one time, uh, Shane ended up throwing his father in the pool, and his father was absolutely livid. And so uh-huh. it's funny, you know, because it's, 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 it's real funny when Vince does it to somebody else, but he doesn't want it done to himself. Of course not. Which is the uh-huh. opposite of when, when he's on TV. When he's on TV, he says, I don't want anyone to complain about anything they have to do on the air because I'll do anything. And that's true. But this was not on the air, and so they didn't think it was so funny because it was not on the air. The storylines made sense. It was rational. They didn't have storyline holes. And Patterson was a wrestler, and Vince had been following it since he was, uh, since he was a teenager. And so, yeah, the shows were coherent. The primary announcer was Ray Morgan, and Ray Morgan got into disagreement with Vincent, uh, uh, with, with, with Vincent James McMahon over money. And, uh, and he says, what are they going to do? You just fired Ray Morgan. We don't have an announcer. What are you going to do? You're going to be the announcer, Vince. And so he took over in 1971. Vince uh, James McMahon forbid his father. I mean, forbid his son from being a wrestler. And Vince really wanted to be a wrestler. He says, well, you're not going to be a wrestler, but I'll put you on air as an announcer. So that was a compromise. And then years later, I mean, he didn't become a wrestler in 1985 when his father was dead. He didn't become a wrestler until 10 years later. And well, he would have been better if he did it in, um, if he did it in, you know, as soon as his father died. He could have done it then when he was younger, but he didn't. But you know what was interesting is, they had those shows about what's wrong in pro wrestling, you know, those, those pro wrestling tragedy shows they had like, on that minor channel recently. Those programs were really good. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And they talked about scandals, and so one of them was they talked about Randy Savage and the death of Miss Elizabeth. And so Linda Belay was telling a story about Lynn Savage and Lenny Poffo and Liz Hewitt. You know, Randy and Elizabeth would come over to the house and... Vince would sometimes come over to the house. So she showed a picture of Vince from, like, 1984. She says, look at him. He was so young. And this picture was Vince on a dining diving board in his Speedos. And Vince was skinny. Vince is, like, huge and muscular now, so he wasn't on the roids back then. In 1984, yeah. he wasn't taking roids. He was a skinny guy. Really? I thought that picture was fascinating. So he didn't even have, like, uh, biceps? Well, yeah, he had that, but, you know, he was like an average guy that worked out. He was nothing special. Right, right. Well, I mean, like, Shane, kind of how Shane looks. Shane is not, like, that big. I don't think Shane took steroids, although he probably did, too, though. You can take a look at that picture that Linda Belay showed of Vince and the Speedo on the diving board, but I got the impression he was actually skinny. He's definitely a character. Uh, someone should do a movie uh, about him. They already are. Somebody is, is it, making a movie about him. Is it authorized by him or is it unauthorized? Yes, it is authorized. And that, was, and that means that means that basically this could be full of lies because Vince yeah. won't let it go to go to air if, if it's not full of lies. Yeah, it, it, for, it's going to be like sports entertainment, like from in the in the seventies. They're going to be calling it sports entertainment in the movie. You know. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Called it WrestleMania, you know, in, in, in 1984, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, you, you, you called it wrestling for 10 years. I know. Yes, he always used the term sports entertainment, but he still called it wrestling. I know, but he's, he, he turns it into a far, he's somehow the word wrestling is some bad thing. You can't say I know, both. it's that way now, but it wasn't always that way. In the golden right. era, it wasn't that way. 
Right. That's a, that's what I was. He called it WrestleMania. Right. He wouldn't have called it that if if he had to do it over again. He would have called it Sports Entertainmania or something. I don't know. Well, Vince has changed. What's wrong with him? He's he's been on a continuous quest to prove to his neighbors in Greenwich, Connecticut, that he's just as much of a blue blood as they are. And if you just make your money from wrestling, then you don't have class. And if you ever watch the, uh, the the old music music video from the original Slammy Awards in 1987, Stand Back, yeah. he, he said, you're going to watch all the other men drop. He drove all the other promoters out of business. That's the bottom line. They were all gone, and he's still there. He's the only billionaire to come out of wrestling ever. Yes. He, and he built himself purely on this shit. So maybe he does know a thing or two. Even Meltzer and Alvarez are buying into it. Oh, the product is horrible. Look at the television ratings. I'm like, who cares whether the product is any good? It doesn't matter about the television ratings. They just signed a huge contract with Fox and with USA for a ridiculous amount of money. Way more than they had before, even though the ratings are going are down. And even Meltzer himself says they're not going to FS1. The ratings would have to completely tank, go absolutely ridiculously bad in order to move to FS1. He says they're not going to FS1. Or if they do go to FS1, yes, the contract would be cut. He would get, they would get less money. But as long as they stay on Fox and USA, they're going to get a ridiculous amount of money, and Vince can go and book shows to amuse himself, and people can scream about how horrible the shows are, and frankly, I'm glad that I don't have to watch it. But they're making boatloads of money. That's the bottom line. It doesn't matter whether the show's any good. It doesn't matter whether anyone shows up the house shows. The only thing that matters is that the checks keep coming in from, from NBC Universal and, for, and from Fox. That's the only thing that matters. But they would do better, and they would get even more money. They would get like 10 times this money if they just did some good booking. I don't Isn't know if true? it would make any difference, because they got, they got ridiculous contracts. You know, Fox and USA totally overpaid for this, because it's DVR-proof. People want to watch it when, it when it airs, and they don't want to watch it on DVR, and there's very little DVR-proof programming. And so it's not about the ratings. It's about that it's DVR-proof, and so that's why it has value to the networks. Yeah, because it's live, right. You know what, though? I think they're doing a better job now that they've got some competition. Yeah, but if you were a wrestling fan, and there's not that many of us left. Meltzer and Alvarez and probably Wade Keller have all said it, which is the business model has has changed, and that it is about getting as much money as you can out of a smaller and smaller group of people. So if you're a part of this very small group of pro wrestling fans, you can watch on television WWE, and most of the, most of the true, a lot of the true wrestling fans hate WWE. Uh, and you can watch AEW. You can watch Impact Wrestling, which is now on a good station. And the station that they're on is owned by the same company, Anthem, that owns uh, Impact Wrestling. So you can watch Impact Wrestling. You can watch uh, Ring of Honor, which is owned by Sinclair. Sinclair is a huge, huge multimedia company. And they put it on their own stations, and so that'll never get canceled. I guess New Japan is starting an American promotion. And then... Obviously, uh, Billy Corgan grew up watching World Championship Wrestling by, you know, that was Jim Crockett because he basically recreated the old TBS studios and he's filming on public access once a week and he's doing a complete knockoff of the old World Championship Wrestling show. And so if you want to watch NWA on YouTube, you can do that. There's like, there are so many different promotions for you to watch and... The great thing is that Sinclair is so cheap that they don't put they don't put any money into Ring of Honor, and they hardly have any house shows, and they just put it on their own station as cheap programming, and so they'll keep that around. And Anthem, Anthem has their station, which they now have um, have impact on, and they have a decent amount of money, so that'll be around. And of course, there's the cons who are billionaires, and so they're putting money into their promotion. And so if you like wrestling, 
not only are there a lot of options out there, and there's Billy Corgan who owns the NWA name, and for people out there, the few people, like people that are in their 50s where the NWA name still means something, you go and you you watch it, and Jim Cornette actually is happy for a change because that's what he grew up and loved was the NWA, and he's the commentary on there, and you can tell he loves doing it. And the old TBS studio with Jim Crockett, and it brings back a lot of memories. And so for the people that that means something to, you can watch that on YouTube. And then there's, then there's New Japan. So if you like wrestling, there are so many options out there. You can go to 31 Flavors and have all 31, as George Foreman used to say. Yeah, so that means that Brian and Dave must be doing better than ever. Back in the old days when there were a lot more wrestling fans, it was pretty much a print newsletter, and so they had a massive amount of subscribers then. And they're not really raising the price that much, so I don't think that they're in as good of a shape because, yes, it helped that Brian and Dave merged, but that was years ago. And so... They don't charge that much more money. WWE and these promotions can say, you can pay more money and get more content. But with Brian and Dave, yeah, they can provide more content, but they're not charging any more money. And so they have a very small audience for content, and so I think it hurts them more that the audience is smaller. Well, I know, but the audience is getting bigger now that there's more choices, probably. I don't, I, I'm not sure. We will see. I think that you have a very small group of people. Yes, I do agree with you. The audience is getting bigger because there's a group of people that like wrestling but hate WWE, and so right. they weren't watching. And now they have these other promotions, and they're coming back because it's not WWE. Yes, there is a small segment like that. That's true. Are the people that are watching AEW, are those the old WCW fans that are now in their 50s? I think they are. If you look at the uh, ratings... They're, they are a huge number. Uh, they're above People that 50. are in their 50s and older. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. They're all well, back. Well, that's interesting because, they, because the people that sell advertising have no interest in people in their 50s. I, I know. <laughs> but they also are attracting <laughs> some young people, too. So, oh, we're about to run out of time here. So Tony Schiavone would say, we're out of time! If you have any questions for Brent, just put Brent in the subject line and email Logan2012 at yahoo.com. Well, as um, John McLaughlin would say, bye-bye. <laughs> See you later, buddy. So that was Brent, and I'll catch up with him on the other side of reality. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll talk soon.